I think everyone can see it. All right, you can see me now? Okay. Uh, shalom, everybody. Uh, my name is Nir. I was born in Israel, as you can tell by my very Israeli name, but I yaradati mi aras sheiti ben shalosh, as ani arbeyot amerikai misraeli. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conduct this workshop in, uh, in, in, in English for today, because my Hebrew is nowhere near as good as it should be for a workshop like this. So that's my... Uh, uh, even though Hebrew is my native tongue, I'm going to speak in English today for today's workshop. And I'm, I'm glad you joined us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about habit-forming technology. And uh, just, can we do a quick sound check, Oded? Do I sound all right? Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, terrific. So I'll, I'll run through a quick overview about how products change our behavior and how products change our day-to-day -day habits. And then we're going to open it up for some question and answer as well here at the end. So uh, uh, save your questions and we'll, we'll get to those as well. So what I've been doing over the past several years is to look for patterns as to how products change our behaviors. How do products form habits? And I, I, one pattern that I noticed immediately studying the science of habit-forming technologies was that many of these companies start out as toys. They start out as these nice-to-have products that Somehow, in the span of a few short years, maybe five to ten years, these products are touching the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions, of users, and they're making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. And so what I've done is to, to look at these companies, and you probably can think of who I'm talking about here, of course. I'm talking about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and WhatsApp, these companies that kind of came out of nowhere and somehow changed people's day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I, I would probably put Waze, an Israeli company, of course, in that category as well, as a company that you know kind of took everyone by surprise and had a billion-dollar exit by changing people's day-to-day -day habits. And so what I wanted to discover is what is common about these companies? What is it that, that makes these companies able to change people's day-to-day -day habits uh, so quickly, relatively speaking? And so I wrote this book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. It's available on Amazon, and uh, I'm sure it's available in Israel as well. And so this, this uh, book that I wrote was really looking at the science of habits, about how uh, products can form these habits. And so just that we're all on the same page, let's define what is a habit. A habit, very simply put, is an impulse to do a behavior with little or no conscious thought. It's about half of what you do, about 40% of what you do every single day, whether you like it or not, is done purely out of habit. And I believe that we can use this power of habits for good. And there's an explosion of companies today trying to help people live happier, healthier, more productive, more connected lives by using the psychology of habit design. And so that's what I want to help you do today. Now, what's at the core of these habit-forming products is called the hook. The hook is an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. Again, that's connecting your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And what we find is through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how consumer preferences are changed, how tastes are formed, and how habits take hold. Hey, Oded, I hope you don't mind. Do you, th do you think you can mute your microphone? I think we're hearing some, um, some noise there in the background. Thank you. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes here is to talk about the hook model, as I call it, these hooks that we find endemic to all sorts of habit-forming products. And the hope is that you can look at your own product, whatever it is that you're building, if your product requires a habit, and by the way, I should say here, not every business needs a habit. Let's be very clear. This is not some magic formula that you sprinkle on top of your business and it's going to be the next Facebook. Not everybody needs a habit. But if your business model depends on habits, just like those companies I mentioned earlier, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, all of these companies require habits because their business models wouldn't survive if they had to spend expensive advertising every time to bring, they needed to bring someone back. So if your business model is like that, if you necessitate unprompted engagement to bring people back time and time again, we're gonna, I'm going to show you this pattern this four-step pattern that we see repeated time and time again in all sorts of habit-forming products so that you can look at your business and figure out 
if what you're doing has the potential to form a habit. Because if you need to form a habit in your product, you have to have these four basic steps. A trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. And so we're going to walk through these four very quickly. First, let's start with the trigger. A trigger is something that tells the user what to do next. It tells the user the next action, and they come in two types, two flavors, if you will. We have internal triggers, and we have our external triggers. External triggers you'll be very familiar with. These are things that tell the user what to do next, but the information for what to do is in the trigger itself. So buy now, click here, a police officer standing at a corner telling you which way to go in traffic, your friend telling you to download this great new app they just tried out, all examples of external triggers. So we in the product design community know all about these external triggers. However, what we don't think about enough, I think, what I, what I tend to see product designers not consider enough are these internal triggers. Internal triggers are also things that tell the user what to do next. They tell them the next action that they should do. However, the information for what to do is not stored in the trigger itself, but instead is informed through an association in the user's mind. So what we do when we're in a particular situation, a place, a routine, around certain people, and most frequently when we experience a certain emotion, dictates what we do next. And so the goal of a habit-forming product is to create an association with these internal triggers. Turns out not just any uh, internal trigger, but it turns out that emotions are the most frequent internal triggers. And most, more specifically even than that, negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling bored or lonesome or powerless or confused or fatigued or fearful, what we do when we experience these negative emotions dictates what we do next, dictates the solution we look for to scratch this itch, these uncomfortable emotions. Some of this, the research that shows this is the case comes to us from the study that found that people suffering from depression check email more. Now let's think about this for a minute. Why would this be? Why would people suffering from depression check email more? Well, it turns out that people suffering from depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states more frequently than the general population. They feel down more frequently than the rest of the population. So what are they doing to boost their mood, to be taken out of that negative valence state? They're checking their devices. They're going on, on the web more frequently than the general population. And of course, we all do this to some degree, right? Where do we go when we're feeling lonely? What, what website do we turn to? Well, that's when we check Facebook. And what about when we're feeling unsure about something? Before we even scan our brains, what do we do? We Google it. And what about when we're feeling bored, you know, between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you have that big project that you need to work on that you really don't feel like getting to right then and there? Well, that's a good time to YouTube or check stock prices or sports scores or the news. Lots of things we can do to scratch this internal trigger of boredom. And so what does this mean for us as product designers? How do we build better knowing this information about internal triggers? Well, it comes down to fundamentally understanding your user's itch. It's very hard to scratch the user's itch, to give the user what they came for, without understanding not only on a functional level what the product needs to do, but also on a psychological level what the product needs to do. So it's very important that you understand your user's internal trigger, their itch. Let's take a look at what made Instagram so habit-forming. Well. Instagram used external triggers at first, right? They use these external triggers to get you to, to see someone's picture on Facebook or Twitter. And then once you click on that, on that button, now you've got the app itself. And the app icon on your phone is an external trigger. You also start getting these notifications that tell you what to do next, to check out your friend's photographs as they post them on, on Instagram as well. Those are external triggers. Now let's talk about the internal triggers. Well, the internal trigger is this sense of solving this pain of losing the moment. When I see something interesting happening in my life, whether it's something cute that my kids might do, or a beautiful sunset, or a meal I'm about to eat that's really wonderful, and I wanna, I wanna keep that experience, well, Instagram scratches that itch of this fear of losing the moment forever. The solution is Instagram. But of course, Instagram does much more than just what any old camera can do, because Instagram is also a social network. So the more we pass through Instagram's hook, the more we begin to associate it with all the other problems it can solve in our lives. When we're feeling stressed or bored or lonely 
Uh, or FOMO. Many of you might know what FOMO is. FOMO is the fear of missing out. We don't like the sensation, the psychological sensation, this negative valence state that we might be missing out on something. And so the solution to that problem is found with the product in our pocket. After the trigger comes the action phase. And I have to apologize here. I know this is a very, very fast run through of this model. I want to give you kind of a quick overview. I should have said it earlier. The book is 250 pages. The class I teach at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford and the Design School is about a three week class and I've got about 20 minutes. So <laughs> we're condensing a lot of information to a little bit of time, but don't worry, there'll be a lot more information to explore afterwards. So let's talk about the action phase. The action phase is the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. And so in all sorts of products that that move the user from this trigger to an action, we find these very, very, very simple behaviors done in anticipation of reward. Something as simple as scrolling on Pinterest or searching on Google or hitting the play button on YouTube. These very, very simple actions done in anticipation of a reward. And it turns out that there's actually a formula for predicting the likelihood of these behaviors. It comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg. And Fogg tells us that for any given behavior B, we need three things, three basic elements that we need for any human behavior to occur. We need sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, and a trigger must be present for any human behavior to occur every single time. So let's talk about these three elements. Motivation is the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. And psychologists have been arguing about the nature of motivation for decades and decades, but basically there are these six human motivators that get users to do a behavior because we all seek pleasure and avoid pain. We seek hope and we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance and we avoid social rejection. So there's a lot more to be said about motivation, but let's keep moving on here uh, so we can get to the, what I think is the more important factor, which is ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular action, how easy or something or difficult something is to do. And it turns out, of course, that the harder something is to do, the less likely that behavior is to occur. And here again, we have these six factors, these six things that make a behavior more or less likely to occur by making it easier or more difficult to do. So how much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is involved, Brain cycles. Brain cycles dictates that the harder something is to understand, the less likely it is that that behavior will occur. Social deviance dictates that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it. And then finally, non-routine dictates that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. And this is why habits are so important, because the more we do something, the more likely it is that it, we will do it in the future because it becomes easier the more we do it. This is, of course, called practice. The more we do it, the easier it becomes, the more likely we are to do it in the future. So Fogg gives us these three things, motivation, ability, and triggers that we can actually plot out on a graph to try and figure out why isn't the user doing the behavior we want them to do. So think about the power of this equation, that for any human behavior, you can try and figure out, hey, why isn't the user doing the thing we want them to do? We've built this beautiful product, but people aren't taking the intended behavior. Why not? Well, does your user have sufficient motivation? There on the left-hand side, on the, on the y-axis. Does your user have sufficient ability? If something is easy to do, it's far to the right. If something is difficult to do, it's far on the left. And if your user has sufficient motivation and sufficient ability, they cross that blue threshold, and if a trigger is present, the behavior will occur every single time, online, offline, doesn't matter. Any human behavior follows these three principles of sufficient motivation, ability, and triggers. Let's take a look at Twitter and how Twitter has evolved over the years using these principles of motivation, ability, and triggers. Here's Twitter's homepage in 2009. Take a good look. Here's Twitter's homepage in 2010. And here's Twitter's homepage today. Now, what do you see that's changed? What's different about the Twitter homepage over the years? Well, clearly, when we look back at 2009, look at all the cognitive load, look at all the thinking the user has to do to figure out the intended behavior. 
Which, speaking of, what is the intended behavior? In all three cases, what has always been the intended behavior? Sign in or sign up. That's always been what Twitter wants people to do on this page. And what Twitter figured out was that by clearing the cognitive clutter, by making it easier for the user to figure out what they should do, they increased the be intended behavior of getting people to sign in or sign up. So the lesson here isn't build a homepage just like Twitter. That's not the lesson. The lesson is what can you do in your user interface to make the intended behavior easier to do. That's the that's a, a guiding should be a guiding principle of all interaction design. How can you make the intended behavior easier to do using these principles of motivation, ability, and a trigger? Let's speed along here to the reward. The reward is a third step of the hook. And when we talk about reward, we need to talk about the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner. And Olds and Milner discovered that when they connected lab animals to this very special part, when they, sorry, when they connected electrodes to this very special part of the brain in lab animals, the nucleus accumbens, and they allowed these lab animals to self-stimulate, meaning that they could send a tiny electrical current to this part of the brain whenever they wanted to. What they found was that the lab animals did so incessantly. They would click and click over and over again. They would, re they would forgo food and water. They would run across painful electrified grids just to continue to click on, this, on these levers to stimulate this part of the brain. In later experiments done on people, they found similar results that people would incessantly activate this part of the brain over and over again to receive this, this sensation. Now, Olds and Milner, turns out, discovered that there's all kinds of things that activate this part of the brain that don't require an electrical current, that in fact your nucleus accumbens is activated every single day. Sex. Luxury goods, certain chemicals, junk food, and of course right there in the center, technology, all of these things activate this very same part of the brain, your nucleus accumbens. Now, Olds and Milner and much of the psychology community assume that the purpose of the nucleus accumbens was to stimulate pleasure. But we now know that that's not exactly the case. That it turns out the nucleus accumbens becomes most stimulated, not by the reward, but not, I'm sorry, not by pleasure, but the reason the nucleus accumbens becomes stimulated, the way it activates our attention and gets us to act, is by stimulating what we call the stress of desire. Not pleasure per se, but the anticipation of the pleasure. Because it turns out the nucleus accumbens becomes most active when we're about to receive a reward. But when we actually get the thing we want, when we get the thing that's supposed to make us happy and make us feel good, look at this that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. So it's not pleasure per se that gets us to act, it's the anticipation of the pleasure that stimulates this itch, this craving, this wanting reflex. This itch that we seek to scratch, that's what drives this habitual behavior with the products we use every day. Now it turns out that there is a way to supercharge this stress of desire. Does anybody want to know how? Is anybody curious? Well, it's because I'm doing it to you right now. So by me asking you a question and taking that long pause just now, some of you might have perked up. Maybe you're thinking, what's he going to say next? Because what I'm doing to you is using this, the unknown. It turns out that variability, a bit of uncertainty, increases focus and engagement. And in all sorts of products that we find most habit-forming, you will find an element of variability. And of course, this comes from the classic research of B.F. Skinner, who discovered that when he took his lab pigeons, he put them in a little box, he gave them a lever to press on. What he found was that the, that the pigeons would press on this lever at first whenever they were hungry. Because what Skinner trained them to do was press on the lever and receive a food pellet, receive a little reward. So basically, the pigeons would press on the lever whenever they were hungry. But then Skinner did something a little different. Skinner introduced a bit of variability. So sometimes the pigeons would peck at the disc, nothing would come out. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times the pigeons pecked at this disc, increased 
when the reward was given on a variable basis of reinforcement. Why? Because we now know that the nucleus accumbens is stimulated by variability. This itch, this craving, this response is activated more highly, more strongly when rewards are given on a variable basis. And so in all sorts of products that you find most engaging, most habit forming, most enticing, you will find one or more of these three variable reward types. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. So let's talk about these very quickly. First comes the rewards of the tribe, the search for social rewards. Rewards of the tribe have to do with things that feel good, that have an element of variability, and come from other people. The search for empathetic joy, partnership, cooperation, competition, all of these things have an element of uncertainty, variability, and come from other people, and of course, feel good. So the best example I can think of online is of course social media. With a site like Facebook, you're never quite sure what you're gonna see when you open the app or when you check on the website. What photos did people post? What are the comments going to say? How many likes does something get? High degree of variability associated with a product like Facebook. Next comes the search for resources, rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt stem from our primal search for food and other material possessions, and of course in modern society we buy these things with money. So when people think of variable rewards, they often think of gambling, they think of slot machines, where pulling on the handle of a slot machine has this variable reward around what you're going to win, right? How much money is going to come out of the machine? But we see a very similar mechanism, surprisingly enough, online. Think about your Twitter feed. When you check a product like Twitter, when you check your feed, or, or any feed for that matter, on Pinterest or Instagram or anywhere you see a feed, there's a bit of variability there. It's this hunt for variable rewards of information because the first thing isn't very interesting. Nah, the second thing isn't very interesting, but maybe the third or fourth thing is very interesting. And to get more of that reward, to get more of these information rewards, all we have to do is keep scrolling and scrolling and searching and searching and never done searching for these variable rewards of the hunt. Finally comes a search for self-achievement, what I call rewards of the self. Rewards of the self have to do with things that feel good, that have an element of variability, but don't come from other people, and aren't about the search for material or information rewards. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. The search for mastery, consistency, control, competency. These are intrinsic motivators. They feel good in and of themselves. So playing a game, for example, even if you're not playing with other people, even if you're not really winning any kind of material possessions, the search for mastery, competency, consistency, getting to the next level, the next achievement, feels good. And of course, it has this element of variability. Now, even if you say to yourself, yeah, but you know what? I don't really play games. I don't really do those angry birds and all that stuff. That's not for me. I bet you you play this game every day. Checking your email inbox to see what just might have come in, what that message says, uh, clearing notifications out of, out of uh, an app that, that tries to entice you to open the app, uh, or clearing your to-dos in your to-do list, all examples of variable rewards of the self, the search for mastery, consistency, competency over something that's inherently variable. One word of warning is that variable rewards are not a free pass, that you still must scratch the user's itch. So this is why there has to be a connection between the variable reward and the internal trigger. So if the internal trigger, what we talked about earlier, that itch is boredom, well then the variable reward has to entertain. If the internal trigger is loneliness, seeking connection, well then the variable reward has to connect people together. There has to be a connection there. We can't just plop in all kinds of variable rewards and expect people to start using the product. It has to actually give the user what they came for and yet leave them wanting more. That's the point of the variable reward phase of the hook. Which brings me finally to the investment phase. The investment phase is the last step of the hook, and it's about a step where the user invests in the product, they take some bit of effort into the product in anticipation of a future benefit. This isn't about immediate gratification, this is for a future reward. It's something the user does to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. And investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook in two ways. Number one, investments load the next trigger. 
So when you send someone a message on WhatsApp or any kind of messaging service for that matter, when you send someone a message, there's no immediate gratification, there's no points, there's no badges, nothing really happens right then. What, what you're doing is investing in that platform because when you send someone a message, you're very likely to get one of these, right? A notification telling you that someone has replied back to you. And of course, what is that? That little red jewel icon, that notification, is an external trigger bringing you back to the app once again. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is by storing value. And this is one of the reasons I love working in technology products so much is because it turns out that, that stored value is very different in technology products versus offline products. That things made out of bits, things made out of, I'm sorry, things made out of atoms depreciate with time. They lose value with wear and tear. However, Things made out of, of, of bits, online products, have the potential to increase in value with the more stored value that's put into them. And this is a very, very important concept because habit-forming technologies should appreciate with use. They should get better and better the more we use them. And they do this because of this principle of stored value. So the more content we put into a site like iTunes, the more content we put in, the better the product becomes as our one and only music service. The more data we put into a product like Mint.com or Pinterest, for example, the better that service becomes for us. It becomes tailored to us. It can do more based on our data. So if you logged into my Pinterest account, it actually wouldn't be that interesting for you because it's been tailored with my data for me. Followers. The more followers I have, the better the product becomes as a way for me to reach my audience. So if, so if if Twitter sent out an email tomorrow that said, I'm sorry, we're shutting down Twitter unless you start paying for it, who's more likely to send them a check? Is it going to be someone with 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Well, of course, it's going to be the person with 10,000 followers because they've stored more value into the product. It's worth more to them if they've invested all this stored value. And then finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank. Because my reputation score on TaskRabbit or eBay or Airbnb dictates what I can charge for my goods and services. And how likely am I to leave one of these platforms once I've accrued all this stored value? It's kind of hard to do. It makes it difficult to leave. So that's it. That's the basis of the hook model, these four steps that we find in all sorts of habit-forming products. And it's through consecutive cycles through these hooks that user preferences are shaped that attitudes are changed, and these habits take hold. So I know that was a lot of information. I apologize. I didn't have enough time to go into great detail, but there's a lot more information in the book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. I hope you'll check it out. You can also look at my blog, nearandfar.com. But this is the most important slide of the presentation, these five fundamental questions that you need to ask yourself if you're building a habit-forming technology. What's the internal trigger that your product ad is addressing? What's the itch? Number two, what's the external trigger that gets the user to the product? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? Number four, is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? Number five, what's the bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the next pass of the user returning? So with these five questions, you can ascertain if your product has the fundamental building blocks of becoming a habit-forming technology. Before I take questions, there's one more thing I want to discuss, and that is the morality of manipulation. That many of you, I hope, during this presentation were thinking to yourself, you know, is this okay? Is this, is this kosher? Is this all right to change people's behaviors, to manipulate them based on their deeper psychology? And if you had that reaction, good for you. I think that is a good response to the information I've just presented to you with, because let's face it. When we are changing people's behavior to meet our ends, that, my friends, is a form of manipulation. And we need to be very careful about how we apply this th these, these tools and how we build them into our technologies. Because the technologies that we're building, this is what our users take with them to bed every night. It's the first thing they reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved ones. And as Ian Bogo said, our technologies are quite possibly becoming the cigarettes of this century. 
So what responsibility do we have as product designers, as builders, as innovators, what responsibility do we have to change user behavior for good? And so what I encourage you to do with this information is to pick one of the world's problems to fix. It's one thing that we have no shortage of. To help people engage in something meaningful and something important. And to build on the words of Gandhi, I encourage you to build the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. And with that, one more thing, I'd love to take some questions. Uh, but while I do that, if you could please go to this URL, it should be on your screen right now, www.opinion2.us. I have a very, very short survey for you there. Notice it's opinion2.us, by the way, not .com. Only five questions. Would love to hear what you thought of the presentation. I'm constantly making tweaks and changes. And then, of course, you can follow me uh, on, on Twitter and my blog. By the way, when you, as soon as you do that survey at opinion2.us, uh, you will be taken to my SlideShare page, like with them as soon as you take that survey at this URL. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Okay. That was really, really great. Uh, of course, the survey itself uh, will be sent with the following email, so everyone will, can fill it out. Uh, under, okay. the, under the screen itself, guys, you have the place to put your questions. So if you can do that, that's great. Um, and I'm going to – we have many viewers, by the way. We have almost uh, 55. I hope the system itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know how it is. So, guys, anyone want to ask a question, perhaps? So, I, I would like to hear more about your previous uh, companies. I mean, the one you sold, if, if that's possible. In sure. Like, I mean, yeah, so the last – yeah. Okay. Can you see me okay, by the way? Is this video coming through all right? Yeah, I can see it. Oh, okay, great. So, um, uh, yeah, the last company, this is how actually I got started in this, in this uh, line of thinking and how I uh, learned about the deeper psychology of user behavior. What, what happened was I was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. So my last company was called Ad Nectar. Uh, we were funded by Kleiner Perkins, and we uh, sold that company a few years later. But we were at the intersection of gaming and advertising, two businesses, two industries that are dependent on mind control. If you think about it, you know, advertisers spend all that money, uh, not for their health, they spend all that money on ads to, to change user behavior. And so I learned a lot of techniques in both these industries of gaming and advertising on how user behavior has changed, and so I took a lot of this learning that that uh, that that uh, acquired in my last company, and that formed the basis of this book. Uh, what I found was that there wasn't a there wasn't a guide, there wasn't a reference manual for how to apply the principles of consumer psychology for good. And so what I'm trying to do is to take many of these techniques that we've seen applied for years and years in gaming and advertising, and to broaden them, to bring them to all of us, so that we can hopefully build healthy habits in users' lives. That sounds brilliant. I, I have to say, as a, as a Jewish person or someone who lives here that values, that uh, contributes to our society and our building some new products and stuff and put it, put it into our day-to-day -day life are really important and it's that, that's admirable like from my point of view and I'm sure our viewers will, will say the same. Um, I have to tell you that uh, for some reason I have a problem with the system. I, I can't reach to the questions themselves, and that's oh. uh, and that's my bit. Uh, and I'm sure I'm gonna I'm going to fix that for the next time. Um, I'm just I'm sorry about that. Is there any uh -huh. any other thing that you wanna you know you wanna touch uh, in this presentation? Of course, uh, everyone can hear us. Um. Yeah, I you know if you if you want to reach out to me, my blog I, you should be able to see my uh, blog URL right here, nearandfar.com. I have a uh, comment section that you can uh, email me straight from my blog. If you, if you have any questions about the book or about my material, feel free to reach out. Uh, and if I can be helpful, let me know. That's really really great. It was a big honor to <laughs> to host you and. Uh, Probably I'm gonna have some angry, you know, letters that people couldn't uh, ask questions. I guess that's part of the game. 
And, um, Darn technology! <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna invite you again. You know, uh, in the near future, I hope you will accept again. Of course, my pleasure. It's good to good to connect, and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out or or send me any questions over Twitter or or uh, through uh, my blog. Okay, so I'm gonna send also your Twitter account if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah, it's just at near al. First name, last name. Okay. Cool. So I'm gonna take the broadcast from now from now. Let me, so now you can see here. So thank you very much again. My pleasure. Thank you. Real pleasure. Um, the, you don't have to give the Q and A part. You know, it's not. It's sometimes it's not about the question. It's not about listening and understanding and then taking it forward. So it's just an action. A, you know, go to action mode. That's that's where we left. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now, guys, uh, below the the video, you can see um, a link to a conference that we are having in Haifa in the uh, uh, Congress. Center in Taifa, it's a very big conference. And if you have a, if you have a, a project that you want to demonstrate, you want to present, perhaps you want to show it to investors, um, a few people are going to check the list and what you are writing over there, and perhaps they come back to you. Perhaps even you, you're going to uh, present it in, uh, in the con uh, conference uh, at the Congress Center in Haifa. So just press the link below, and you can reach it. I'll send the, the, this, uh, this beautiful talk uh, through the next mail, email, and I will send also the next, uh, more information how to reach and how to do get some answers properly. Um, I wish you all the best, and I'm very, very happy you've been with us for this lovely evening. Thank you again, Nir. It was My pleasure. A, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.